relax a little bit. Once people give that word gift, we just relax and sit back and say, gosh, what does that mean to that person? How does that person feel about that giving? And we just appreciate them for a moment as a giver or as a human being. Just what do they feel? What does that mean? And this is what fundamentally philanthropic psychology is about. We are academics, we're not fundraisers, we're not agencies, we're not journalists. So we can afford to take that one step back to say, reflectively, what exactly does that mean? We only need to worry about publishing it, we don't have to worry about making money out of it. But we are committed. If you want to make money out of our research, we'll tell you how. And the way we tell you how is through our research projects. And all five of our signature projects are grouped around this idea of understanding what does the giving does to the giver. And we're going to publish the first book on philanthropic psychology uh, by the end of this year. And to support that process, which that, that book itself is a summary of everything that has been published on the topic, mostly from the direction from the giver to giving. If there's anything that the teacher has possibly said about the reverse dimension, you will find it there, because that's what I have been looking for in that literature. And then the conclusion, obviously, from the book is that what has been published in that reversed causality is not enough. So we have to collect more evidence to tell us how we can think about that. And the first way we think we will collect evidence is by building the longest running sample of a wide range of wealthy philanthropists. So you can think of yourself as a wealthy person who can give money, and that's how this research will relate to you. But in fundraising terms, these people are usually taken care of by major gift officers. And what we would like to do is we would like to have a collection of these people's life journey in giving. And we'll examine this collection of life journeys through the lens of philanthropic psychology. But <coughs> as ambition goals, what does longest actually mean? What does the best actually mean in this situation? Well, one thing I can tell you is that the longest ever longitudinal study on people's in general lives is 75 years, and that started from 1938 in Harvard. So they tracked about 200 some undergraduate sophomores in Harvard for 75 years to understand what makes a good life. <coughs> and they found, oh, it's a lot that makes a good life after $20 million of investment in the research. <laughs> but when we do that <laughs> for philanthropists, well, usually it takes about two years for new philanthropists to actually understand, oh, actually doing philanthropy requires a lot of knowledge and work and commitment, and it causes a lot of frustration usually in the first two years. But once they realize that, it actually doesn't take them that long, maybe five to seven years for them to then find their own way in the world of philanthropy. And a philanthropist through their lifetime don't do exactly the same thing for 30 years. But every time they want to change their giving approach, they're going to go through another three to five years of transition. So when we say the longest, and if you think about general low volume giving starts from age 45, then you're thinking about tracking people who have made three times of changes in their philanthropic journey for about 30 years. And since we're in our 30s and we don't retire until 30 some years later,